All right, I'm going to post a link to the README file for this talk on the FreeCodeCamp channel. Um, I've found a few typos and stuff that I've fixed since then, so if you want to follow along there, just kind of be aware. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about content security policy and how we can use it to defend our web applications against cross-site scripting. Uh, my name is Bryce Yeck. I work at the Oklahoma State University Foundation. I've been developing web and network applications for around four years. I used to work uh, for a wireless internet service provider in Stillwater, uh, building web and network applications, primarily in Python. Uh, you can find me on Slack. Um, here's links to my GitHub and LinkedIn. Um, outside of here, I play a lot of foosball. Um, I also like to longboard, garden, um, and I mess around on the web a lot. All right, so what is content security policy? Um, from the Mozilla Developer Network, content security policy is an added layer of security that helps to defend and mitigate certain types of attacks, including cross-site scripting and data injection attacks. These attacks are used for everything from data theft to site defacement and the distribution of malware. So what does it do? Um, a content security policy allows us to instruct the browser on the origins from which scripts, styles, images, frames, and other resources can be loaded and executed. A content security policy should not be your only layer of defense against cross-site scripting attacks. User input should still be sanitized, never trusted. Um, when leveraged correctly, however, a robust content security policy can be extremely versatile application towards your defense in depth strategy. Um, how many of you guys know what cross-site scripting is? Kind of, right? Okay, so basically it's whenever, um, well here, I'll just read it straight from the Mozilla Developer Network. Um, Cross-site scripting is a security exploit which allows an attacker to inject malicious client-side code into a website. This code is executed by the victim's web browser and lets attackers bypass access controls and impersonate users. According to OWASP, XSS was the third most common web application vulnerability in 2013. And it's still really high on the list. <laughs> um, so the way that we deploy a content security policy is via HTTP headers. Is everyone familiar with those? Yes, no, a little bit, okay. Um, basically, they are an additional part to a HTTP request or response and they convey additional meaning about it. Here's a shot of a few response headers from GitHub. Um, we can see that they also implement a content security policy that we will be looking at a little bit later. So um, the most widely supported version of it currently is version two. All of the keywords and directives that we're gonna talk about are covered in this version. Browser support is sometimes limited um, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later as well. To use a content security policy, we must return the content security policy header, and it is this here below. Um, here's some examples on how you can set this up for common web servers. We're not gonna go over all of them, but instructions are posted, it's pretty easy to do. Um, popular web frameworks are also going to allow for you, they're gonna provide interfaces through which you can set custom HTTP headers. Um, if you plan on having a singular policy for your entire site, uh, then it's usually best to set this header directly via the web server. If you don't have access to set an HTTP header, um, you can also specify it as a meta tag embedded in the head of the document. So before we look at a list of keywords and directives, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples. So here we set the content security policy header and we set a default source of self. The default source is going to um, cover any directives that we don't directly specify. So everything in this example must be loaded from self. Um, self refers to the current origin. So if we are on mydomain.com, the current origin is mydomain.com. Okay, so here, um, this policy restricts JavaScript to be loaded via HTTPS from the current origin, and it allows unsafe inline scripts to be run. It also restricts CSS to load via HTTPS, also from the current origin, and allows for inline styles. 
It also restricts all other content to be loaded from the current origin. So the HTTPS keyword there, um, it just specifies that it must be loaded over HTTPS. It won't upgrade those requests. So if you specify an HTTP resource anywhere in your document, it's gonna throw an error and it's gonna block it. Okay, so here's a more restrictive example. Um, here we set the default source to none. None is basically going to block the loading of that type of resource. And then for scripts, styles, and images, we declare that those just have to be loaded via the current origin with the self keyword. Now, these are not inherited. So if you specify a default source of none, that will block everything unless you explicitly say that, yes, we want to load that type of resource, and here's how. So why is the use of inline JavaScript and CSS considered unsafe? Um, browsers don't really have any way of determining the difference between your code and code that may have been left there by an attacker. Um, so yeah, we have to use the content security policy in order to instruct them on what is safe and what is not. So do you guys know what causes a script to be inline versus having been loaded from somewhere else? Um, basically, if it, it's inline if it's part of a script tag that hasn't been loaded via the source attribute. Also, HTML attributes such as on click, on load, on error, all of those, those are also considered inline script. Um, style attributes are the same. Anything inside of a style block as well as the style attribute in an HTML element is considered inline style. When a CSP is enabled and the script source unsafe inline or style source unsafe inline directives are not specified, inline JavaScript and CSS evaluation are blocked. However, an inline script tag can also be evaluated if it has a valid nonce attribute or if it matches an already specified SHA-256 hash. And we'll talk about what both of those mean here in just a moment. So use of functions such as eval are also considered unsafe. Um, we can use the unsafe eval keyword to allow the use of text to JavaScript functions such as eval, set timeout, and new function. They're also considered unsafe because untrusted user input could get into these functions and be evaluated as JavaScript, which can be super dangerous. So eval, set timeout, and new function are blocked because strings can be passed to them. When using set timeout, though, only the string evaluation is blocked. If you pass it an inline function, it still works normally. OK, so here's a list of most of the keywords that we can use in CSP version 2. None we already talked about. It basically blocks the use of the specified source. Um, self is going to refer to the current origin. Unsafe inline will allow us to run JavaScript and CSS inline. Unsafe eval allows us to use eval, set timeout, and passing it a string in those. HTTPS is going to restrict us to HTTPS. Nonce here is where we can specify a nonce value that we also put into the nonce attribute of a script or style tag and allow it to run in line. So if you have a situation where you just absolutely cannot get those scripts out of line, then we can specify a nonce to get around it. SHA-256 works similarly, except that you have to specify the hash along with it, and then the browser is going to hash the contents of that script or style tag and compare the hashes. If they match, it will run. If they don't, it will block it and log the error. We can also specify the um, data keyword, which allows us to load resources um, via the data scheme, such as base64 images. So. Here's a table of all of the directives that we can use. Um, we won't go over all of them. The default source we've talked about, script source, style source, and image source basically just say where we can load scripts and images and styles from. Connect is important. It's going to restrict where, H, where XML HTTP requests, uh, web sockets, and event source connections can go to. to. A font source is going to allow us to restrict where fonts can be loaded from. Um, another important one is frame ancestors. So this is going to restrict origins from which the current page can be embedded. Um, this is going to apply to frames, iframes, embeds, and applets on other sites. If we set this to none, it's roughly the equivalent of setting the X frame options header to deny. 
Um, in this table, this is some more directives. The report URI is another one that's going to be very important. Um, we're going to touch on that later. Basically, it allows us to specify a URL to which the browser will post policy violations to for us to collect. The upgrade insecure request is also really useful for sites where you may have a bunch of HTTP links that need to be upgraded. You can specify this keyword here and it will upgrade those for you. Okay, so production content security policy. Um, here's the one from GitHub that we saw earlier. Um, they set theirs up a little bit more restrictive, which is good and to be encouraged. Um, the default source for everything is none, and then they go back and they override sources that they want to allow. Okay, so how do we test our policy once we have it built? Um, you can supply a content security policy report only header, and it will cause the browser to report on policy violations with, and post the uh, violation reports without actually blocking those resources from loading. It can be used to help you fine tune your policy um, and test out new directives without making breaking changes on your current site. Okay, so the report URI directive. Um, this is super useful for collecting and aggregating information on report violations. Um, there could be resources that we've missed or it could be an attacker that's found a cross-site scripting hole and is actively trying to exploit it. Aside from logged violations in the console, without violation reporting, we don't really have any idea of what policies are being violated and why. The report URI is used to specify the URL to which the browser should post these JSON formatted violation reports to in the event that it has to take action on our security policy. So um, here's an example of what one of these report violations might look like. Um, if we are on the domain, mydomain.com at our index.html file, and it's subject to the above policy, if there's an image tag on there, um, I've given an example here of trying to load the favicon over HTTP. In the security policy above, though, we've stated that our default source should be HTTPS. So this is a direct violation of our policy. And the browser is going to post a report that looks like this here at the bottom. Um, it's gonna give us the URI of the page that we're on, a refer if it had one when the policy was violated, as well as the URI for the resource that was blocked. Um, some browsers will give you the violated directive. It just kind of depends on, it's kind of hit or miss on that one, but it will give the original policy, which will have the violated directive in there. <clears throat> so our endpoint that we set up at the cspreport.mydomain.com um, I'm sorry, that was specified in the last slide here in the policy up above. So our endpoint there, it should capture this data and log it for us to take a look at later. Um, you can use it to identify pages and resources which are most frequently being violated and address those first and then move on to pages that aren't being violated quite as often. So browser support. Um, Version 2 is pretty widely supported. Um, it has been for a while. Internet Explorer still does not have support for it yet. Um, thankfully though, with the report violations that we can collect, we can still go in and fix the issues that, are, that may be affecting other users. And so the reporting from the other browsers kind of helps us keep everyone who's using Internet Explorer a little bit more safe. Okay, so in summary, a content security policy is an extremely versatile, flexible defense mechanism for defending against cross-site scripting attacks. CSPs allow us to instruct browsers on which web resources can be trusted, allowing them to block other potentially unsafe resources. CSPs can be defined in an HTTP response header or in an HTML meta tag in the, in the document head. Inline CSS and JavaScript are considered unsafe. Use of eval, new function, and set timeout when past a string and similar methods are also considered unsafe. CSPs have keywords such as self that give us a shorter syntax and allow us to more safely include inline code with the use of hashes and or nonces. 
The content security policy report only header allows us to report on CSP violations without actually blocking content. And the report URI directive is extremely useful for aggregating policy violations and allowing us to address the highest trafficked issues first. So setting this up is pretty easy. Um, a lot of us use web frameworks, though, that rely on inline JavaScript and CSS, which can be a pain. Um, both React and Angular have workarounds for having all of this inline code um, and styles. Um, so those workarounds are available. Um, they're not really all that difficult to implement, and it's definitely worth the time um, to add an extra layer of security against cross-site scripting, which is super nasty um, if it gets, if, you know, if there are uh, cross-site scripting attack vectors on your site. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so, cross-site scripting, is that more of a uh, security vulnerability that occurs on the server or on the client side? Is on the client side, the server? Right. So, there are several different types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Um, the most common one is the stored cross-site scripting attack. And basically, that's going to happen where, say you have like a, uh, a form on your page that allows you to add comments, right? And those, the, the data that you submit gets shown to other users. Well, if I embed a script tag in there um, and that gets executed as JavaScript on other users' browsers, then I can do all kinds of really nasty things to those users. Um, you can steal cookies. I mean, there's, it, it opens up the door to tons and tons of other security vulnerabilities. Um, there's also DOM-based cross-site scripting attacks as well as reflected cross-site scripting attacks. Um, in the markdown file that I shared, there's a link to cross-site scripting on OWASP, which is a really good resource for web security. It's a good question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, you're talking about, are you talking about the tables that listed the, all of these? No, so these are, this is a list of the directives that you can use in your policy. Um, there's a much, much longer list. These are kind of just the most important ones. Um, I have some links in that markdown file also to the full list as well as maybe the, um, the spec for CSP version 2. I don't know if I included that or not. Um, but yeah, yeah, so you wouldn't see that. Now, you would see headers like this whenever you inspect element and then go over to your network tab and then click on any resource there. It's going to show you the request and response headers that the browser um, is giving you. So yeah, that's, that's where those are. Any other questions? All right, well, I did prepare you guys a meme and I didn't get to it, so. So, 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 questions? Thank you.